<laughs> if you um if you're tuning in here and you're wondering why I'm so highly amused here, it's um because we're doing our uh, probably weekly, right? I guess maybe that's the plan, right? A weekly breakdown of our sort of our fantasy league that's uh, clearly way too early since it's only August at the moment, and uh, and some of the madness is going on already in the um, transactions uh, between some of these um what do you call them league managers maybe team managers, and um I guess look we're gonna work our way through some of these transactions which you can see on the screen that's uh, happened uh, in the free agency um sort of pool here. Um, but you know, I, I guess some of you who are obviously looking here, watching here, uh, are probably already having a laugh that, uh, what's going on, but Hey, look, let's start with the first one, man. You were the first guy that got this ball rolling, right? <laughs> if someone saw someone made a transaction and everyone else figured out they could jump on it and, and, and try and do something to, I don't know, make their team better. Isn't that the idea? Is that, is that why you grab Kyle Kuzma? Yeah, look, with a six-team draft or a six-team league, you're going to have some flexibility. The FIBA World Cup being played at the same time as these recordings are, we have injuries popping up. We just have performances that are encouraging, right? So in Team USA, Austin Reeves is looking quite positive, and you can see him being picked up in one of the acquisitions. But we'll go chronological because I think that's important. Um, I upgraded Keegan Murray to Kyle Kuzma. It just gives me more across the board. Three-point percentage was the wrong way to approach it. Probably better in a big league, not great in a six-team league. You look at Brooklyn and they toggled Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving to likely to trade. So that means that I would assume there was potentially some trade offers being floated around that were, you know, never made it to surface. Kevin Durant, I can see why you may do that. Probably going to play 50 games next season. Maybe he gets to 65 for all NBA purposes, but his goal is titles. It's not anything else. It's not individual accolades. Kyrie Irving, I mean, we've kind of commented on the volatility of him. We will get further up the I, list and we'll I, I talk a little firstly, bit more with about the, him. With the likely to trade, I feel I feel in fantasy league, if you are a proactive manager, let's be clear here. Every single player on your roster is available for trade. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Luca Luca's my my franchise player on my roster. He's available for trade. Yeah. If you give me Jokic and throw in a maybe a sweetener too, I'll I'll really consider it. See, that's the point, right? It has to be something that, you know that makes sense. I think that's sometimes where, um, you know, obviously no one's made a trade yet, a lot of free agency movements, okay? But trades have to make sense for both sides. Too often you sort of think about your side and how it makes sense for you, but you have to think, well, how does it make sense for that other team you're trying to trade with? And and why would they maybe pull the trigger on it? It, I mean, I've definitely looked at a couple of my players and I'm trying to figure out how to convince someone else to take a package that, doesn't favor me, but favors the return, so to speak. But you have to acknowledge that you've probably got to give them a little bit of compromise, right? So when I think of James Harden on the trade block, I do need to potentially look at players like Wemby and Chet, who are yet to prove anything, but have prospective value that may convince someone else to give up a known quantity. But at this stage in the season, again, we're still multiple months out from playing. So it is difficult to know, you know, what the true value is. As we go up that list, we see Pascal Siakam ending... Um, his tenure on the team before it's even started. You feel really passionate about this, and I'm sure you're going to unpack it a little bit more, but Pascal Siakam, just in case we're not aware, we both really like this pickup for $11. I think this is one of those retroactive, we probably should have run the price up higher. He's close to a 24, 25-point scorer, I believe eight or nine rebounds, four or five assists, a couple of steals, a couple of blocks, on a team in Toronto that doesn't really have a clear direction and is clearly in a little bit of a rebuild, but we've talked as well in previous pods, Pascal Siakam doing well means Toronto doesn't. And I don't know what their end goal is, but that is potentially their 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 trajectory. That I, want I believe that team manager indicated to me that he dropped Pascal Siakam because he didn't like his face. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> But you can right. see that That's he's right. you can That's see right. that he slotted into Aaron Gordon, right? Yeah. So Aaron yeah. Gordon. So we've dropped the number one option in the, in the Raptors, and we picked up the fourth option for the Nuggets. So that's um. <laughs> yeah, look, I didn't touch Aaron Gordon for this exact reason. I felt like his fantasy stats. I'm not talking about impact on winning and championship caliber experience. I'm talking about impact on fantasy stats. The box score. Kyle Kuzma was a better pick than Aaron Gordon, and absolutely ignoring the fact. The, the auxiliary stats, you know, we're talking steals and blocks, maybe a little bit better. But he, that was it. That was it. And we don't know what the role will be in Aaron Gordon. He might come and have a bit of a breakout year with that championship bolster behind him. But 
to give up Pascal Siakam number one option on a team that wasn't going to be very good and was going to give you pretty good garbage stats, but you know, to assist you in a fantasy league, questionable to say the least. I guess uh, if we move up to the next list, uh, here, you know what? Here's actually a pickup that probably makes sense. Yeah. Duncan Robinson, um, whoever selected him to be drafted, you know, clearly a bit of a tactical ploy there, I think. So um, look, the guy, the guy just doesn't get enough minutes to produce. I think that's the point. Yeah, you know, he's, he's clearly a rotational player if you want a three-point shooter to come off the bench in that sort of sense. But, um, you know, grabbing Austin Reeves and he's, uh, he's, he's peaking at the moment. Yeah, he's got his own shoe deal now, playing for Team USA. Um, he's, his star's only going to continue to rise there. So, um, you know, you know what? You know, credit to, what is it? Under six foot, you know, making actually a smart, logical move there on the free agency, <laughs> you know, move there. It's... It, there, I did see a stat going around that when Austin Reeves slotted into the starting lineup with Westbrook's removal from the team, he went from about 13 points to 16 to 17 points per game. And you can see him being the third option on the Lakers moving forward. You can see the trust that LeBron has in him and this confidence he's getting from Team USA. High chance to have a breakout season, which when you're talking about a six-team league, there's already so many players. Like I'm looking at my utility players or the players that will sit on the bench. They're still good players. So these are decisions you have to make. And for Austin Reeves, if he doesn't peak, then that's okay. Sits on your bench. But if he does peak, then you've gotten a bit of a steal. We we move on to the death, the death of a running gag. Um, and it's really hard that it's happened this early in the season. But we farewell Lewis King, whoever he may be, and whatever he may achieve. Uh, because Rui Hachimura has taken Lewis King's place. Not a terrible pickup. Again, anything's an upgrade over Lewis King. Rui Hachi is so, potentially banking, a double-double potential. Someone's banking on him having a great year, though. Let's be clear. <laughs> there there were other free agents, and you look at this waiver wire still. Brooke Lopez being there, Wagner being there, uh, now Jamal Murray. Sorry, not Jamal Murray. Kyrie Irving being there. There are better players than Rui Hachimura on the free agency list. Um, but, again, with the Lakers, the interesting thing with the Lakers is LeBron and AD are the key. But these young guys, Austin Rees, Rui Hachimura, they have the potential to be impactful regular season players, right? Get those stats up, have those big games. And we saw a game from Rui uh, against Memphis that was, you know, multiple threes, close to 30 points, 10 rebounds, et cetera. He's got that potential within him. And again, as I mentioned, you have to have some players on the bench. Maybe he's one of those players for you. And if he starts to peak, it becomes a trade asset. It's still better than Lewis King. We're all better off for this now. We can move on with our lives. Which uh, which brings us to the next one here. What do we got? Added Sangoon, dropped Brook Lopez, Brick City, and and watching some of Brick City's transactions so far, <laughs> I uh, I've got some questionable uh, thoughts on um why he's actually playing fantasy league, <laughs> but uh, but that's okay. Um, again, maybe um, you know Sangoon will. You know, continue to build on you know his young career, and uh, his stats might outpace Brook Lopez's established career. <laughs> I guess that's the the catch there. Um, look, at the end of the day, I I don't think, I think you know Houston is an interesting one here. You know, some players are going to give me fantasy stats. We talked about this a little bit, I think, um, but it's going to sort of fluctuate from day to day, game to game, in that sense because they're so young. Yeah, and Sengun will have some hot games and then have some cold games. And he's surrounded with all these shooters, right? All these guys that want to shoot and shoot and shoot. So I don't know if he if he grabs 10 boards, gives you a couple of blocks, you'd probably take that. But I think that's a role that's already established for Brook Lopez, right? At the Bucks for several years now. And I think, uh, again, I probably would have gone the other way around as in keeping Brook Lopez. But hey, that's all right. <laughs> It's it's a little bit of like for like here. So uh, I put up the stats because I was curious. Brook Lopez had about 16 points, seven rebounds, one assist. This is according to Basketball Reference and decent sw- shooting splits with a couple of blocks. Shengun is about the same. So similar points, slightly more rebounds, slightly more assists, same blocks and pretty good shooting. So what I guess they're banking on is Brook Lopez is old and had some injuries and maybe won't play as many games as Shengun. But the issue with Shengun is we don't know what's going to happen with the Rockets with their new additions. They are a drastically different team than they were last season. They're no longer that young team that gets to put up stats. How is this going to work for him? What's his role going to be with a new coach as well? We could see Shengun becoming a pivotal point of the offense, or we could see him relegated to the bench for other players. So that will be a time will tell. It's a gamble. Um, Again, considering Pascal Siakam was still on the board at that 
stage, it is a curious one. Then looks like you did something. Uh, I'm very jealous of this one. Miles Bridges is a great pickup because you're just putting him into that injury replacement slot and then you get to make a call a little bit later on if you do anything with it. Obviously coming off the suspension, but you know we're talking about a guy that was a 20-point scorer with a bit of a breakout season happening. A whole year off, is there going to be rust? Is there going to be really good rest? But it also, it really doubles down on your commitment that you hate Franz Wagner. And um, I... You know, I don't, no, I don't know. Let's be clear. Say. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. I do not hate Franz Wagner. Yeah, let's let's make a cut a clip out of that. I love Franz Wagner for the Germany team. Okay, um, but but uh, for my fantasy team, the logical move was a no brainer. I sat here about two a.m. at night here. And uh, for some reason, for some reason, I guess in part because we were doing this podcast, I thought I'd have a look at the fantasy, what's going on in fantasy league. I hadn't looked at it for four or five days. It's like, you know, August, right? <laughs> in the sense, right? And I was like, someone dropped Pascal Siakam. This was before the madness that's going to touch upon in a sec that someone dropped Kyrie Irving. But, <laughs> but someone dropped Pascal Siakam, a guy that's averaged 25 and a 7 and 7 roughly last season. And now is the clear-cut number one option for the Raptors. All right. And I was like, okay. And I've already told, told you this, you know, off, off, off air that, um, you know, Wagner was probably the most logical drop on my team, even though the team's deep because we're only a six league team. And so the numbers simply dictated I had to make that move. <laughs> There's nothing more to it, guys. So, you know, love Franz Wagner, you know, for Germany. Hopefully you guys win some games at FIBA. <laughs> but uh, he's not the guy for me. Maybe someone else. You know what? Someone else should grab him. That's the key, right? I think the other owners, including you, should probably look up and down your roster right now and grab Franz Wagner, okay? If he's still sitting there and, like, once he clears waivers, I think you, you guys are crazy. But, hey, look, that's up to you. <laughs> All right. Um, but, look, Siakam over Wagner, long as he stays healthy, that's always the catch with any player, right? Is clearly an upgrade. And like you said, man, it allowed me to also make some moves here to obviously add uh, Miles Bridges into the injury spot at the moment on my roster. And there's not many players at the moment, key players, obviously, listed as injured at the moment. So like you said, I get to have a good look at him, see whether he starts, whether Brandon Miller's going to pinch minutes from him or the other way around. Um, let's see where his game's at. Worst case, I'm going to have to make a decision to drop him or drop someone else. Or like you said, someone might roll an ankle and be out, um, you know, for you know, for six months or something like that from the FIBA team. And that sort of throws um, throws things out a little bit, you know, for your, for your plan A. So, um, hey, look. Thanks, dude, for uh, for that drop, man. <laughs> and it's going to feel like there's a bit of a pause from our last discussion to this one. Because after the Pascal Siakam drop, uh, we have Jamal Murray entering a team and then instantly leaving the team to be added to a different team for another player to be dropped and then another player to be picked up. I'm going to be honest, this feels like collusion. I'm going to say it. It feels like a little bit of collusion is going on there where um, a lot of movement in a very short period of time. But let's go through it. Jamal Murray, we acknowledge, is probably the second option on the Denver Nuggets, currently not playing in the FIBA World Cup due to, I guess, health concerns post his ACL surgery in which he played his first full season after you know almost two years. Phenomenal player. I ranked him as having a bit of a boom this season going into it. But I would not be naive enough to think that on a fantasy setting, he is going to be an impactful player. Probably sitting some back-to-backs, going to rely on Jokic to carry that very potent up-and-down uh, box score guy. So he might have a game where he has 40, might have a game where he has 10. You saw that in the Phoenix series. It's probably the best snapshot there where he can go toe-to-toe with Devin Booker for a game, and then he can also disappear completely for a game. And we can say that a lot about a couple of volume scorers, but... That's probably the key phrase that I'll end on there. He is a volume scorer, really. That would be what he adds to your team and probably not the addition that you would be hoping for at that pace. And because of this, because of this addition, we have Kyrie Irving entering the free agency pool. And I think a lot of people have some some difficult decisions to make, including myself, because Kyrie Irving, for all of the drama, all of the issues, sitting there at a free agent, which is a click of a button away, is not a terrible option because can potentially give you 28 points, about five rebounds, about five assists. And we know he's potentially going to play because it's a whole new contract with whole new expectations that plays alongside Luca, and we know that that didn't impact winning, but it did impact stats. So I'm quite torn 
I'm really quite torn. What are your thoughts on Kyrie Irving being available? Sometimes the best moves in NBA fantasy are the moves you don't make, right? <laughs> That's sort of what you're alluding to right now, isn't it? And um, it's it's madness. Yeah, I used the word madness earlier when, when we touched upon this, that Kyrie is hitting the free agency pile right now, 27 points, five rebounds, six assists, like you talked about, plus a steal or two a game. Um, but do you need those stats to win? Yeah, and who do you drop? especially in a six-team, see, there, here's the catch, right? Especially in a six-team um, sort of league, who do you drop to take the Kyrie Irving experience on board, right? And um, I, I don't know, I, I look up and down my list um, and I'm sort of like, look, you know, he's probably got stats that are potentially superior to some of the players that I've got, but, you know, my other players do other things. You know, they play, give you more steals and blocks and they do some other things too. Um, you know, and also opportunity for growth. You know, opportunity for risk there. Kyrie Irving, I, I personally think, and we touched upon this somewhere, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, I think the Mavs are going to implode. <laughs> That's my my feeling, right? I think the Mavs are going to implode, implode. I think I said somewhere, you know, on our recordings that I think Kyrie's going to be on the trading block by the time, uh, you know, trade deadline comes along. Okay, because you ain't moving Luca, so you're putting Kyrie back on the block, and who will take him? What can you get for Kyrie Irving, and where will he land next? Lakers, maybe. <laughs> who knows, right? Um, so I don't know. Someone, someone's gonna grab him if someone hasn't already put a waiver claim for him. Okay, you know, because now he's climbing on waivers, and uh, it would probably make sense that you someone jumps in early. Um, but you know, you you sort of. Which which fantasy owner out there is willing to take that risk and that gamble? Um, yeah, and look, I, I don't know. Um, obviously, someone decided that Jamal Murray is probably a, a safer bet, <laughs> and and maybe so, maybe so. He might play. He might play seventy games, and Kyrie made only clock fifty. I don't know. There's twenty extra games there. Um, and, and someone obviously thought uh, Scoot Henderson. Clearly, they know something going on with Dame Lillard, right? Maybe that's what's insider news <laughs> that he's he's out of town. So Scoot Henderson's now the the lead man at the at the Trailblazers now. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something here, dude. But um, I don't know. What do you reckon? Are you going to claim Kyrie Irving? So if I were to make a claim on Kyrie Irving, because I am looking at it, I am trying to decide. I feel like the James Harden swap is the one. Right, I take one dramatic superstar for another. And Kyrie's stats are better in the points category and better in the turnovers category, but that's it. It's not better in the assists and it's not better in the rebounds. And I could potentially end the season with both of them only playing 30 or 40 games and both of them having huge nights and then also having really disappointing nights. I think one thing that I'm coming back to a little bit is this fantasy league will only give you credit for your top 10 players. And there are three players that must sit on the bench. And you can get a wealth of riches, but you are eventually going to have three players sitting on the bench and you run the risk of one of them having a big night. So Kyrie Evan would be a great pickup, but who am I playing over the top of him and how do I make those decisions? I have to lock Kyrie in for a week. And is that the week that Kyrie Evan goes missing? And I think availability is a really underrated box score that doesn't show up that perhaps we need to start highlighting a little bit. You don't want more than one or two guys that are erratic because you need players that are going to play every night or you need players that are going to play at least three out of four nights. And adding Kyrie Irving, you sign up for a very unpredictable experience. It's it's very tantalizing. There's a high ceiling there. It's very interesting. But I personally don't feel comfortable taking the risk because it doesn't feel like a need. I don't need to squeeze six more points from an average standpoint out of my team when I will lose a couple of assists, lose some rebounds and, and et cetera. The Scoot Henderson pick, I believe it's not a bad one. So I think you're poo-pooing it a bit more than you should. He's going to be in contention for rookie of the year. And the difference between him and Chet and Wemby is he's not a seven footer who has a risk of getting injured. And I understand that I have both of those players at present. I did that because I felt like they're going to go for the 65 games. They're young. I'm going to bank on the what, what do you think Scoot's stats are going to be? Give me give me a guess right now. What do you think project his first year stats are, um, assuming Lillard doesn't move? If Lillard doesn't move and plays, because that's an extra variable to this, I think Scoot could quite safely average about 18 points, uh, maybe four rebounds, four assists, 
maybe a steal, maybe a block. 18, 18 four, and four off the bench. There, the reason why <laughs> I feel I feel no, you no, yeah, no, I feel you on the scoot hype train right now, which no, 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 which is okay. quite not warranted. I don't know. He's going to average more than Victor Wembanyama effectively saying right now. Either that or on par. I think Scoot is not your typical rookie. He has not come from the college system. He's not come from the international game. He's done the G League Ignite experience for two straight years, and he's competed against pretty good talent and been very competitive. I would be banking on that. And if not, as I said before, with the bench logic, he can sit on your bench. He can sit on the on the bottom of the list. But eventually, if Dame Lillard does get traded, his stats go up. And if he doesn't get traded, I still think he's a productive enough professional to be quite decent. I don't hate it as a pickup. It's definitely a good pickup for a roster that, for some reason, dropped Pascal Siakam. Right? I think they're they're the they're the clever moves that start to hide a really bad move. I, I I think you I think you're overrating Scoot Henderson. Um, like I don't know if you if you think he's going to get 18 points even when Dame is in town still. Um, I don't know. You're basically saying that if Dame leaves, you think Scoot's going to average over 20 points a game. Um, and I think that's a bit of a stretch as a rookie. Okay, I think he could be a he could be a special talent if he establishes in himself in the league. Um, he's highly explosive, but he's he's not big. Yeah, he's not a big guard. Yeah, he's not a big guard, and and I uh, look, I think he can definitely have a you know be maybe one day an all star potentially, but um, I think he's got a lot of work to do. You know, there's a lot of talented guards out there, and the even if Dame Lillard gets moved, um, you know, from the from Portland, they have a lot of young talent. Assuming they're going to bring in more assets too, you know, what they get in return for Dame Lillard, Portland are going to play everyone. They're going to play everyone. All right? They got Sheldon Sharp there. They got uh, Anthony Simons. Um, you know, these guys take touches, take minutes away too. Um, and they, they've got a year, a couple of years, obviously, for Simons on on Scoot in that sense uh, as an established player here. Um, I don't know. I, I feel his best case scenario is probably with Lillard out of town, maybe something like, I don't know, 16 and 8. 16 and 8. Best case scenario. Okay, and uh, you know, hopefully he can sort of shoot at reasonable um, splits. Worst case scenario, you're probably looking at another season of a uh, season, perhaps something like uh, we had with uh, Shugs. All right, remember Jalen Shugs, and obviously the season that we had with him with his rookie year and how up and down it was, and you know, he was a top four pick there. All right, he was supposed to be all that hype. Okay, and uh, look, I think Scoot Henderson better than him. Okay, but you know, it's a there's an adjustment to be made in your rookie year. I. I will happily let footage go on the internet saying that I'm a little bit more optimistic yeah. than you. I'm not too phased yeah. about that. I think I think the G League experience is going to prevent that Jalen Suggs uh, bust potential. I think that he's played against professionals, dude. He's played against grown men who are competing. You probably want to put him in his place a little bit, and he stood his ground. He did quite well. I would be quite confident he's going to be okay. Yes, he's competing for a lot of guard minutes, but I think it's in Portland's best interest to figure out what they have in Scoot. There's already a lot of hype going around that. They refuse to trade the pick in any assistance for Dame packages. I think they see something. I think it's okay for us to see something. And yeah, yeah, we might regret that one. Slipping through, I'm not sure. I guess uh, we can definitely look back on our thoughts on Scoot Henderson, you know, maybe in six months' time, right? But um, look, I guess uh, that player sums up the movement, obviously, in the last seven days, <laughs> you know, way too early fantasy league. <laughs> And uh, and I guess uh, look, let's uh, let's have a look at this in seven days' time. Uh, we might see Giannis on the on the free agency pile or something like that too, right? <laughs> but um, but you know, but if if everyone starts to like get a little bit, you know, you know, settles down a little bit, we might actually not see any transactions right in the next seven days because who the hell knows what's going to happen in the next two months? <laughs> yeah, well, look, leagues are doing stuff. There is some data being uh, generated currently for like most added and. Um dropped players but it is way too early a lot can change in two months that is enough time for a lot of minor to even moderate uh injuries recover in the nba so anyone who does a wrinkle in the FIBA world cup they they may be perfectly healthy and ready to go on day on day dot so yeah some patience might be needed to be exhausted here um and you know and the other thing as well we need games to play because we need to figure out okay in my head i think i'm going to get this amount of points or blocks or assists but i need to see it for a week or two or even three and start to figure out where do i rank amongst the league and 
you know, I feel like maybe in a couple of weeks into the actual games being played, that's where we'll see some trades being made. That's where we'll figure out that, hey, like, I'm not sure if you're aware, but OG Ananobi is actually, you know, not worthy of your team. And he ends up getting dropped. Or on the flip, you know, Scoot Henderson hasn't panned out. It's actually been an absolute train wreck really quickly. Get rid of him. Or in my case, hey, Wemby just like did his ACL in the first game. He pulled a Gordon Haywood. Like, I've completely lost that pick. And now I've got to go elsewhere. We, I, I, we probably... I think you're touching, on a, you're touching on you're touching on a sort of a a challenging area of fantasy league, and you've got Victor Wembanyama, and you've got Chet Holmgren, and now under six foot has Scoot Henderson. You need to exhibit some level of patience with a rookie, but how long do you wait? See, that's the key, right? Do you wait till December? Do you wait till January? Do you go? They're going to turn the corner after the All Star game and finish off the season strong, but then at that point, are they banged up? Um, you know, is it just not going to happen for them? Is the team going to start to manage the minutes because their team's not in any position to, you know, make a playoff push or anything like that? Victor Wembenyama, if the Spurs have 15 wins at that point or 20 wins at that point, they're going to trim his minutes. They're going to shut him down. Yeah, they're not going to need him to play that last sort of three to four weeks anyway, you know. And then now you've got a huge decisions to make in that sense with rookies. So uh, I don't know. Good luck to all you guys that got rookies, um, <laughs> you know, um, and you got two of them, dude. <laughs> this is two guys with spare time. I'm Faz. This is Nick. You're probably a basketball fan like us. So hopefully you can throw us an assist and giving our viewer a like and uh, subscribing to our channel. And if you got thoughts, feelings, or even some suggestions, please put them down in the comment section below. And thank you for using your spare time to watch us in our spare time.